everybody. I'm back at my daughter Bethany's house. And uh, today I went to Church Unlimited. And Bethany was there, but she was helping in the nursery. So she didn't actually get to uh, be in the service. And she's going to watch it later. I'll comment a little bit. Um, today, uh, Bill uh, was teaching on is uh, the comparisons between Islam and Christianity. And uh, I might just uh, share a little bit of some history. Um, the teachings I'm doing right now, I just began the book of Acts at Becky's house, and I'm going to do the whole book of Acts. I already wrote a commentary on it, but I'm going to uh, do videos on the book of Acts because that gives us the history of the early church, and it's in the Bible. So... That's a Bible book that actually covers the history of the early church. And the teaching I'm doing on the book of Galatians, it really is covering the main story of what makes the difference between Christianity and other religions, which is most other religions, if you, if you just do a comparison in general, the way... They approach pleasing God and being with God after death is through obedience to the law. That's the primary way most other religions take the view. Now, it does not mean they do not have good elements contained within their religions. For instance, Bill Covered, I did a study, I did a brief study on Islam a few years ago when I was going to hit the five main pillars or teachings of Islam, but the one, and Bill had that in the message today, which is charity to the poor, which is a good element. Nobody would have a problem with that. And so when I taught it, I basically was trying to hit on uh, any good elements that you would ever see, not meaning that we agree or justify the beliefs of everything that that religion might have, but it's okay if there are good elements in various religions. But um, I'll, I'll share just a, a few quick things. But the main difference uh, that we're doing, as you see me teach the New Testament, well, is Christianity has salvation, whatever terms of the religions used, being in paradise after death. It's Salvation in Christianity is not based on the good deeds that people do. That was the whole time of the law or the Old Covenant, which I'm teaching in Galatians. And the purpose of the Old Covenant or the law and the commandments from Sinai was to reveal the sin to humans, to show man that he fell short of the mark, that he could not live up to the law. And Paul is teaching, as I teach the book of Galatians, that the purpose of the law was to just reveal sin to people. So good works, and they're all good things. But man could never save himself through the works of the law simply because man is in sin. And he can never completely live up to the holy standard of God. Jesus was the only person that was sinless. And he died as a substitute for the sins of men, paying the price for sin because it says in Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So in a nutshell, that's the primary difference between all of the other religions and Christianity. In Christianity, you have what we refer to as the atonement, Jesus paying the price of the sins for people. Okay? Now, um, a few. I'll just give a few little examples of... Um, I wanted to cover a, a little brief history of uh, Islam arose in the 7th century, which uh, Bill mentioned today, and I remember in the past. I've taught a lot of church history in the past, and some people uh, used to ask me, and why do you say Islam arose in the 7th century, which is in the 600s AD? I said, well, because that's uh, Muhammad lived then, okay? But the rise of Islam, it's interesting that sometimes I think Christians are not familiar with some of the similarities, not only between some of the protests that Islam 
and Muhammad had were the same types of protests that some other Christian groups also had against what you would refer to as orthodoxy or organized Christianity, meaning this. In the first century, which I'm teaching the Book of Acts, we had the Jesus movement, and it's called the Way. And so Jesus gathers these followers to him. We have the Gospels that tell us the life and teachings of Jesus, the four Gospels. And then we begin seeing how God was supernaturally working in that early church, which I'm going to do in the next couple months, the whole book of Acts. Now, as history developed and Christian history developed, at the end of the first century, early on, and, be, and into the second century, you had more of an organized uh, Christianity, which I'm not critical of, but you had the rise of what we called the bishops and how they were predominant leaders in the early church. And then over time, you had five men, uh, main areas, if I remember them all, but there were five, Antioch, Jerusalem, Alexandria, um, Rome, and uh, one other. These were the five main areas where the Christians began, the Christian church began having a central sort of like person, what we'll refer to as a bishop, and the Christians were kind of um, under that bishop. All right, and the development of the Christian church, you had the development of not just the Roman Catholic Church, but orthodoxy. So it was pretty much stable the way they came to understand the order of the church and the way the church would be organized. Well, now you also had in Christian history Christians who disagreed with a lot of that. You had Christians who began saying, well, the church, the established church, you have statues. And some Christians began saying, one of the commandments talks about we're not supposed to have uh, other gods before us and so forth. And so therefore, uh, the images, other Christians said, we don't like the statues, all right? John, are you against statues and Christian art? No, I'm not. But some other Christians began saying, hey, we got a protest here. S other groups of Christians, also I've covered a lot of this history, they began saying, wait a minute, the way, and I covered a lot of this over my years of teaching Christian history, but some Christians began saying, wait a minute, the way the historic Orthodox main Christian church is teaching, which is Trinity, which I believe, God, one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But many groups of Christians, all the way up until the present hour, say, we don't like the way you describe it, and some groups actually say, you who believe in the Trinity, you have, you're, you know, totally left what the early Christians believed, and so you got a lot of these debates. Now, I'm familiar with them, and I do not look at some of these other Christian groups who are sincere, and they have different emphasis on the Trinity. I don't look at them as a bunch of people that are head in hell, but I understand that these Christians also had difficulty with the way the Trinity is been, has been expressed. They had differences about no more, we don't want statues, so it's a violation. Okay. Many in the early movement of Islam had the same objections. Some within Islam, and as the movement started, they actually said the same thing. They said, wait a minute. You believe in three gods, and there is only one God. The same objection. Now, we don't believe in three gods, historic Christianity. We believe in one God in three persons. But you could see how even some other Christian groups started having that. The Bill mentioned it today, and I've taught this before. Actually, they, had, they believed that some of the Christians were teaching God was one God, the Father, Jesus was the other, and then they believed, the Christians believed that Mary, the Virgin Mary, was the third part of the Trinity. No, no, Christians never believed that. 
So that's, some refer to that as one of the classic misunderstandings. So the early Muslims said, you Christians believe in three. You believe in God the Father, you believe in Jesus as God, which we do, the deity of Christ. And then they were saying, then you believe that Mary's one. No, uh, we, the church has never believed that Mary is deity. Neither the Catholic Church nor the Protestant Church has never believed in that Mary was one of them. But it's, I share that just to show you that we also had others down the road, Christian groups, that said, your expression of the Trinity we have a problem with. Okay. Islam, early on, also said, we don't like the statues. Many Christians did the same thing. We had what was referred to in church history as the iconoclast controversy. Okay? Icono it just means the idol smashers. Okay? Iconoclast. I told you before. So they said, we don't like the icons, we don't like the images, and some Protestant Christians actually did the same as some of the Muslims and said, we're going to just break all these statues and images because we think it's a violation of the commandments. And even in the wars in the last few years, when radical Islam actually goes into a certain area, and we see on the news, like, oh, they're destroying all the ancient art and statues. That's the reason they're doing that. Some of, now, I'm not agreeing with it, but I'm saying it's interesting because some of these objections are the same objections that other followers of what they felt God said in the Bible was also. So there's some, uh, one of the things I'll mention that maybe is not as familiar, I, I, don't, I didn't study at all for any of these, but one thing I was going to cheat and Google, I tried to Google the Muslim apologist who preceded St. Thomas Aquinas. All right, so I managed to get that in the search, but it pulled up everything about uh, Obama is a secret Muslim to every other thing in the book on Google. I wanted the name. Okay. Why did I want that name? Because I figured I might discuss a little of this history that I'm covering. What we cover in world history is a period called the Renaissance, which I taught also in the past. But the Renaissance was the recapturing of the culture and art and the writings and works from that were gone for a long period of time or missing. And the works from the philosophers like Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, the writings of uh, the ancient Re uh, Greco-Roman world, a lot of that during what we refer to somewhat as the Dark Ages was kind of missing, okay? Well, because of some of the Muslim, and we have what we refer to as the Crusades and things of that nature, some of the works from the past, now I'm talking right around the turn of the first millennium, meaning about the year 1000, right at that time, uh, you had some of these works were being rediscovered, written, and going out, and some of this uh, occurred, a lot of it occurred in the Muslim world. And then you had the rise of uh, the apologists who were defending belief in God, and some of them were coming from the Muslim world. And there was one in particular I wanted to get uh, the name of. It begins with an A, maybe Abbasad or something. I, I could not find on Google. But he, the reason he was important was a great Christian thinker in the 13th century, which is the 1200s, his name is Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas began developing what we kind of, you see me do, apologetics, a defense of God, a defense of God and, and nature, how God reveals himself to humans. So this Christian man, who is referred to as the Dr. Angelicus, the angelic doctor of the Catholic Church, but he's a great uh, Christian teacher by the name of Aquinas, he, as a response to the Muslim apologists who were arguing for God and for the existence of God, Aquinas did some great writings. But it's to show that you had in history, as you study the history, particularly of the Renaissance, which was that the catchphrase for the Renaissance was ad fontes, okay, A.D. 
and then another word, F-O-N-T-E-S. Ed Fontes meant back to the sources because there was the re rediscovery of the ancient works of the philosophers that I mentioned, and so they said, oh, we're going to get back to the sources. <laughs> so the Renaissance, what we normally look at, it, it, uh, which was out of Flor uh, the base of it, you could say, was Florence, Italy. You had a very famous family called the Medicis. Now, the Medicis were a banking family, Italian family, but they kind of were corrupt. They were in control of a lot of things, and they were very influential in the picking of the popes and things of this nature, okay? But the Medicis, uh, I'm going to guess right around 1300s and all, this was the beginning of what we kind of look at as the European Renaissance. But you had a Renaissance in the Muslim world that actually preceded what most of us study when we study Renaissance. Now, why did I do all that? I'm just showing you that there were some good things that did indeed come out of Islam. Most of us look at what's very obvious today within the Islamic world, <clears throat> a lot of the stuff that's going on. But when you look at world history and you cover it in that view, you see there were some beneficial things. And even the recapturing of the arguments for the existence of God there were some uh, Muslim apologists who argued the same arguments that Christians use for the existence of God and the same arguments that the Jewish people use for the existence of God. So that's all a commonality, all right? And then where we have the distinctions, I already mentioned most of it, that in Christianity you have Jesus Christ paying the price for the sins of man. Uh, Bill Cornelius, Pastor Bill, did bring out that and the Quran, Muslims uh, do accept Jesus as a prophet of God, but they do not accept that he died, which was one of the big debates, and they, uh, that somebody else died, Jesus did not die. The Gnostics, who I covered their history uh, many, many times before, the Gnostics had the same thing, that Jesus was not a real physical man who died, but they referred to him as a phantom, so you had these differences. We in the Christian faith believe Jesus was truly God, <coughs> truly man, and he died for the sins of man upon the cross. Uh, I'll give a few little examples of, and not only died, but was raised again. Um, over the years, just, you know, my interactions, this I could give more than one about Muslim people that I've, been friends with or I've met. Um, one time I, I used to go to the county jails and do a Bible study in Claybrook County, which is Kingsville, was a city within Claybrook County where I retired from the fire department. And I used to go every Sunday and do Bible studies. And we had a lot of guys, the, many of my friends that I met were through me doing those Bible studies. But there was, we had some Muslim people there in Kingsville, and especially because we had the famous university, a and I University, which is now A&M. And uh, I think one of the guys might have been a student that got in trouble and was in jail. But he was a Muslim that, you know, when I did my Bible studies, he was up there for a few months, and I'd go every Sunday. And he asked me once, he said, well, I'm Muslim. And I said, that's fine. I'm going to just do Bible study. And then he said, uh, could you get me a New Testament or a Bible? in the Persian language. He wanted to read it in Persian, which I'm assuming was his. I said, yes, I'll get it for you. And I used to order the Bibles from the International Bible Society, you know, just fill it out. I used to do stuff like that. And it took about three weeks, and I got the Persian Bible. And uh, it, was, it wasn't leather or anything. I remember it. It was like a plastic. And I looked at it. I couldn't read it. But I was a, when I brought it to him like that next Sunday, he was just so shocked that I actually got it for him. Maybe he had asked other Christians in the past, you know, I, I wouldn't mind reading it if you get me one in Persian. But that stuck with him. He said, I can't believe you remembered. And I, I would write the note down, like if somebody, I still have a notebook, this is one for my cough. And, but I, I would write the note down if somebody asked something or I was going to visit a particular person. That stuck with him, that I just got him that Bible, more so 
then uh, it may be even him reading it, which would be a good sign of how I think we would be good witnesses to Muslim people, just to, through acts of charity, to reaching out to them. One other story I'll remember, and I'll tell this one from Kingsville, before or after 9-11, the tragedy, and of course I'm working at the fire department, so we'd had to keep up on any, you know, so-called, you know, things to watch out for that could be dangerous because we're first responders. But the station I was working at, one of them was right off of the university, almost right on the property of, it's now Texas A&M Kingsville. So that far house was a city department, but we were right there by the college. And it wasn't that uncommon maybe for students over the years to like walk in because fire departments had open door policy and in our fire house, you know, we had the stall garage doors open all day long, you know, and the ambulances, trucks are all there. Look, and we never had problems with people robbing them or stealing them or anything like that. But one day, a, a Muslim person was walking through our firehouse. And I remember my captain, Rael, he said, John, go check that guy out. What's he doing? He didn't know we could see him. We were like in a little area. So I went out into the garage of the firehouse where the trucks and ambulances are. And I'll be honest, he looked a little suspicious to me because he kind of was just walking around seeing who was there. And so I went out and I said, oh, uh, can I help you? And he says, I'm doing a research project on fire trucks and all. And now later I realized that does sound strange. You know, who's going to... But either way, it was... You know, so as we were talking, uh, he was dressed in the clothing that I could tell he was a Muslim, which... And he brought that up himself. Now, I... Uh, was teaching the Bible for many years, and I was familiar with a lot of the scriptures you see me quote, and maybe it was a little off guard because I'm in the fire department thing, and I, and he said, I, he says, I got a question. He says, how come all the Christians in the West, the United States, know? he says, but look at all the things that the Christians in the United States do, involvement in other countries, all that stuff that goes on, I, and I told him, I said, well, I said, most everyone in the United States is not a practicing Christian, though that's the way the Islamic world in the East actually does view it. I said, but that's really a false view. I said, a lot of people in my country are not really Christians seeking God, serving God. And then I asked him a couple questions about it. I said, you know, the distinctions between Islam and Christianity, and the, and I taught much of what I taught the last six months on Genesis and how there was a promise. I've been teaching this for months, but God made a promise to Abraham, and he said to Abraham, I'm going to give you a son one day, and from that son, Abraham, the whole world will be blessed. And Abraham, it took some time before his wife Sarah got pregnant, and during that time, Abraham cooked up a couple of schemes thinking, well, God, my wife's not pregnant yet. Now I'm teaching this to this Muslim guy at the firehouse. And eventually, uh, Abraham had a son with a woman by the name of Hagar, which Bill taught us today correctly. And Hagar's and Abraham's son, his name was Ishmael. Now Ishmael is the father, the Muslims trace all of their roots Arab people, Muslims, all Arabs are not Muslim, I always have to say that, but many are. And they trace their roots to this one son of Abraham by the name of Ishmael. Now, I'm doing this little Bible study with this Muslim man. I thought maybe he knew this. And then I explained, I said, but God had another son, or God, Abraham had another son, Isaac. I said, and then Isaac, and I went through the history, and I said, now eventually, Jesus Christ was born through the lineage of Isaac. And, I, and now he was familiar with Jesus, but not in the same way we as Christians are. And then I explained the gospel. I said, but when Jesus died, he died to save all humanity, including all the seed or the children from Ishmael, 
meaning all Arab or Muslim, but he died for everybody. He died for the Jewish people. He died for the non-Jews, the Gentiles. I said, so the promise to God, the promise of God to Abraham in Jesus. So I did a, a somewhat of a 30-minute study with him. I thought he was familiar with some of it, and I'll never forget his face because he was listening. And then I said, but you know this, you know, you know the, the story, the history. And, you know, if he was dishonest, he would have probably said, oh, yeah, yes, yes. But I'm, he said, I've never heard this before. That was the first time he really heard it explained that Christianity and Jesus Christ coming from, because the three great religions of the world all trace their roots back to Abraham, all right? Christianity, because the Messiah comes through the offspring of all the way from Abraham. Islam, because of Ishmael. And of course, Judaism, you have Father Abraham. But his surprise and his honesty by saying, no, I've never heard that. I think that was just good. It was not too long after that, maybe within a couple of weeks or months, that the federal government put out a notice to all fire departments, secure your garage doors, keep because there was some chatter in the intelligence that uh, some radicals were seeing how easy it would be to get into and to steal a fire truck or an ambulance and to use that. And I think a couple of cases happened, but it wasn't long after that that we got that report, and it always made me wonder. Maybe he was... I don't know if he was radicalized or maybe he was just seeing how easy it was to be able to go in. But so the, that's just a couple of little examples. <clears throat> Ultimately, as we share the gospel with people, we want to make sure that they understand the message. A lot of people, a lot of divisions also take place. Like I said, Islam had a, a, a mistake in what they thought Christians believed. Because Christians certainly did not believe that Mary was one of the Trin a part of the Trinity, but that's a classic mistake, and I think uh, most of them realize now. But they still, some still think that that's what Christians believe. And as we, uh, m some of my friends, even some of my street friends, they have thought because there was a Muslim guy that showed up in Flower Bluff a few years ago. His name was Roman. Well, Roman was an interesting person. Uh, he used to be a Christian. I'm not sure if he was in the military or what. And then he converted to Muslim. And But he was somewhat of a nice guy. And, of course, some of my other friends, like right away, they kind of... And I, I wasn't agreeing with him, but as he sat with me in New Old John's, like a preacher or whatever, I talked to him like I just shared some of the things. Well, then the guys told me, oh, that guy came back, John. I might have went to New Jersey on a trip or something. <coughs> and he was asking for you and all. And they were, my friends were a little like, they didn't like me being too friendly with him, you know. And I said, well, I said, I'm not justifying what he believes. I said, but I'm just talking with him. Okay. Well, then my friend Bobby, who you've seen Bobby on some of the videos. I have some that says Bobby preaches. And a lot of times Bobby's drunk when you see him talking, but... I let him talk on the videos. But you know, Bobby, uh, one time, he said, well, maybe you're right, John, like about uh, being friendly with that Muslim guy. He said he was coming back from Padre Island, walking. Might have been drunk one day. This was a few years ago. And he said as trucks were passing him, people passing him, they were kind of yelling out the truck about, you know, you bum and stuff like that. And Bobby told me, he said, one lady stopped, and it was a Muslim lady in the whole Muslim. He said, and she gave me a ride Aww. all the way back. And now that was charity, which is taught within Christianity as well as in Islam. Muslim. Now, I, uh, that would not challenge our disagreements that we have with Islam and all, but it, would ju it shows you the human aspect of how we deal with some of these issues. So I'll... I'll close with that, but that, that's a little bit of the history because I did about 30 minutes. It's a little bit of the history of, the, there's a lot of history, but uh, that, po that one point is normally overlooked that there was uh, 
uh, a renaissance that took place within the Muslim world prior to what we m normally refer to as the Renaissance. And the Renaissance was a great period of uh, a rediscovery of a lot of the writers, a lot of teachings. Much of this led, some of this led to the Protestant Reformation, which is in the, uh, this year is the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, which was 1517. It's dated to 1517 when the great reformer Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany, which began the Protestant Reformation. But Martin Luther had a, a debates, discussions with a Catholic humanist by the name of Desiderius Erasmus, okay? Uh, somewhat of a uh, Renaissance man, if you will. Well, Erasmus stayed with the Catholic Church, Luther would break away, but Erasmus was, you know, a smart guy, and they had debates, and Erasmus was also critical of the Church at that stage. Erasmus right in the 1400s, coming into 1500s. But Erasmus was one of the first, he, he interpreted the first New Testament from the, right from the Greek, because you had now back to the sources. And many of the scholars were using versions that were okay, but they were not from the original Greek manuscript or Greek New Testament, which is written in. Uh, some had access, but Erasmus was the first to make his translation from the original sources, okay? And that led to some of the leaders, priests and others at the time, to get back to the original New Testament, which later on you had various uh, English copies come out. But that was part of the idea of back to the sources, meaning let's get to the original sources. And so part of that Renaissance ideal of let's, let's go and look what the original says led to what we refer to as the Reformation a lot of uh, church leaders and priests and others saying, "No, let's see what it, uh, let's see what the Bible is saying. Let's get back to it, which is really a great thing that did take place in the history of the church." And then there was uh, it became more available to the common man. A lot of great people were involved in that, but that was also a product of what we refer to as the Renaissance. So, what translation was that called? Or does it... Oh, I forget the name of his. Some of the first English translation of the Bible, and I think Bobby got was getting this a little wrong, but the King James out of England, which I still read the King James. That's the one you hear me quote, but that comes all the way back from the 1600s from the translation there. The first one was called the, uh, oh, I uh Coverdale, Miles, oh, Co yeah. Miles Coverdale, I believe the Coverdale Bible was the uh, first English that was prominent, the, and the, na the man's name is Miles Coverdale, but then you had, a, uh, I have the Geneva Bible, which is, I actually have one that, it's a Reformation study Bible, I ordered it a few years ago from R.C. Sproul, so you had a few, the King James became the most popular one. King James translation, but it was Miles Coverdale. There were some men, uh, John Wycliffe, uh, you have a lot of famous people right at this period of time, 13, 14, 1500s, and the Bible was just beginning to get out, and in the 1400s, Gutenberg invented uh, the first printing press, and it just so happens that the first I believe the first book that came off of the actual printing press, first one that was ever invented, was, was a Bible. And so you had a really beginning of the Bible, back to the sources, getting out. And when it got out into the common hands, now the Catholic Church had a warning, okay? And some of the leadership in the church said, if we let the Bible get out to everybody, there's going to be... Uh, too many dangers of misinterpretations and too many dangers of everybody having their own little beliefs if the church splits. This was the Catholic side when they were debating with Martin Luther. There were three main reformers, meaning three main people.
that really led the, the split of the church in the 16th century. And one was called Ulrich uh, Zwingli, and one was John Calvin, and one was Martin Luther. These were the three main leaders of the, we call them the magisterial reformers. But as they were debating back and forth with the Catholic Church and some of the issues that arose, Martin Luther was really the premier one that launched the breakaway. But the Catholic Church's warning was, leaders of the church, bishops, they warned, if you go down this route, you're going to have so many divided churches down the road, which in a sense did indeed come true. And then they said you're going to have the danger of everybody interpreting. Uh, maybe they're going to go to the book of Revelation and interpret things. And now you have some things like that that happen, uh, the Munster prophets, okay? And different. some of that did happen, but overall it was, I believe, God's will that everybody would be able to have a Bible and they'd be able to see what the Bible says themselves. And that that was really getting the word of God out. So it was a good thing that it took place. And um, the main split within Christianity is dated back to that time, if you will. That's where a lot of, a lot of history comes out of that time. Um, and I've covered a lot of this over the years. But we, as the thing we have in common with the Muslims was the arguments for the existence of God. When we argue for the reality of God, the existence of God, Jewish uh, apologists, Christian apologists, and Muslim apologists all would agree with, and many of those arguments that later some of the Christians used came first from some of those Muslims at that period of time, all right? Uh, n- not exclusively, because you had St. Augustine in the earlier uh, fourth, fifth century year. Uh, he was a great genius, uh, Christian Catholic man. But some of the good things we got out of Islam were the arguments for God, and, and we all kind of agree with that. The distinction is we in the Christian church believe that we are saved because Jesus died for the sins of men, was buried and rose again. And it's not up to our good works. That's a distinction Christians have with both Muslims and Jewish people. Okay? It's not the old covenant work system, which I'm teaching in Galatians. It's not that. And it's atonement, Jesus dying for the sins of men. That's the main distinction. But that offer is for all people. Muslim people, Jewish people, the offer. Many Jewish people have become Christians. And there was a whole movement a few years ago. I used to read a lot of the Christian magazines and all. But there was a a whole movement within Islam where many were embracing Jesus and saying he he is the Son of God. We're going to accept him as the Son of God. And there was somewhat of many miracles were reported where uh, in Muslim communities where hardly anyone was believing in Jesus. I've read these a few years ago, and not just from like Christianity Today, a reputable Christian magazine, they said like a uh, man would have a vision of Jesus at night, and he came to a particular uh, Muslim man in in maybe a tribal area or something like that, but this man uh, said how Christ appeared to him, and many of them became followers of Christ, and so there are some testimonies, stories of people in the Muslim world that are converting to Jesus, and some are including supernatural events and things of that nature. Okay, we went a little long. Any questions? I'll try to, when I do my uh, post, my writing, I'll try and give the name of that particular Muslim apologist that was right at the time of Aquinas, and some of the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas uh, were sort of somewhat of a disagreement with some of what the Muslim apologists were saying, and this kind of developed uh, some of Aquinas' views as well. So that was important for the history of Christianity. So I think we'll end with that. I thought Bill had one good verse. I've never (coughs) fully read the Koran. I think I've had a Koran once, and I like, there was one verse um, from Surah, 
for 157-158. Now, this is one that denies, but this is the Quran. And they said, now this is a criticism of Christians from the Quran. And they said in boast, we killed Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, but they killed him not, nor crucified him. But so it was made to appear to them, and those who differ therein are full of doubts, with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow, for of a surety they killed him not. Now this is the verse in the Quran, which is denying the death of Jesus on the cross. But you know, I never read that particular one, but at the end it says, no, but Allah raised him up unto himself, which is the reference to God in the Quran. And I like the end, I underlined the end. It said, that's Surah 4, 157, 158. It said, but Allah raised him up unto himself. You know, now, if I were going to use that from a Quran to speak to a Muslim person, I would say, you know, you could interpret it. You know, and me arguing for Christianity, I said, you can interpret it if you wanted. I said that he, that it's just saying he didn't remain dead, but God raised him up. Now, that's not what it's saying, but if I was going to argue with the Muslim and, and trying to give him something, I'd say, look, we believe, yes, God did raise him up. Now, that passage is also denying that I understand what the passage is saying, okay? I'm familiar with that argument, that they're denying that Jesus actually died, okay? That's the same mistake the Gnostics have made. But I would use the end of that to say to any Muslim friend, yes, God did raise him from the dead, and even your Quran teaches it. I would use it in that way just to kind of like use what you can to convince mm -hmm. somebody. All right. Makes sense, yeah. Now do a brief recap. Of the... <laughs> All right. We'll end with that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for letting us have another little uh, study at Bethany's house. And I pray for all of the Muslim people and all of the Jewish people and all of the other religions and faiths. I pray that through Jesus they would be blessed. That the scripture says that uh, you, Jesus was sent to bless us all to deliver us from our sins. And that Paul said that Satan has blinded the minds of those that believe not. So we pray that the power of God, it says in John's Gospel, that the light shined into the world and the darkness could not overcome it. So we pray that the light of the Gospel, like the man I spoke to, a Muslim man many years ago at the firehouse, his eyes seemed to be open that day I talked to him. So we pray the light to shine. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.